Okay, everybody, welcome. This session will be recorded to be able to share with those who were not able to join us today. If you have any questions, please post them into the chat and I will monitor the questions. You can message just me, Kevin Hall, if you need to. And please make sure you stay muted until the question and answer when you're called on to be able to then contribute. So welcome to this exciting event. My name is Kevin Hull. I work for the nonprofit CARES, which is excited to present this event within VA's National Research Week. This is an annual week dedicated to showcasing all of the innovations, advances, and impact of the VA's research enterprise. We're hosting a Healing Power of Nature session today, which will be moderated and guided by Terry Horton. I'm excited to introduce Terry. She's been a mentor and inspiration for me about the healing power of nature, myself as a cancer survivor, seeking a lot of solace and healing in nature. So Terry, thank you so much for helping bring this group together. Thank you everybody for being here, especially thanks to our speakers, our international guests, and the collaborators that we look to forge partnerships with going forward. So Terry, thank you for hosting today. Well, thank you, Kevin, for inviting me and for helping you know, pull this whole group together. Um, I'd like to share my screen and give a little brief introduction, but not take up too much time because we've got a lot of territory to cover. There we go. So as Kevin introduced, we are talking about the power of nature to heal today. And this is within the VA's National Research Week, but it is also um, in celebration of the May is Mental Health Awareness Month, which the organization that I um, organize, the Nature, Culture, and Human Health, we're running a month-long campaign. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, where I um, study the health benefits of spending time in nature um, in the Department of Anthropology at Northwestern. So um, one thing, if you happen to be live tweeting, um, NCH2 is running its campaign this month on May as Mental Health, and we have these hashtags that we are using to promote events related to May as Mental Health Month, and including this one. And those hashtags are take five outside to thrive, tools to thrive outside and cultivate well-being. So our webpage for NCH2 for the tools to thrive outside for this month, um, you can just go to our website, which is nch2.org and look for our May as Mental Health Awareness Month page to find other resources and events related to this month. So I think it's very important to recognize as we set out and discuss the power of nature to heal that Congre the Congress of the United States of America recognized last year the, the value of nature to heal. And through um, House Resolution 8 8247, which became the Veterans Compact Act of 2020, um, it requires the VA as part of this act in section 20, 203 to establish a task force on outdoor recreation for veterans to report on and make recommendations regarding the use of public lands and other outdoor spaces for medical treatment and therapy for veterans. And this became law on December 5th in 2020. So this is a very exciting time for the concept of health and nature. Um, and um, we will see that value coming forward. Sorry, I just got distracted by something in the chat. I'm gonna ignore the chat. If anybody has something directed at me, scream at me. Um, mental, okay. Giving you a brief um, background on mental health statistics. Um, prior, and these are statistics from prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we all are aware things have shifted somewhat because of the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, one in five adults in America experienced a mental illness. And in 2018, more than 1.7 million veterans received treatment in a VA mental health specialty facility. And while PTSD gets a lot of press, many of the more common, more general um, 
mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. And as um, Sally Coulthard will mention based on her research, recognizing issues related to loss of identity affect many, many more veterans. And all of these are issues that may be addressed by incorporating time outside as an adjunctive therapy to helping people deal with these sources of stress and even diagnosed mental um, illnesses. So just as some examples of recently published research in this field is that um, one from about 2018, I believe, I didn't put the date on here, is the Enhancing the Well-Being of Veterans Using Extended Group-Based Nature Recreations by Jason Duvall and Rachel Kaplan, and a paper from 2020 on outdoor recreation programs for veterans, public land policies and practiced practices to support therapeutic opportunities. And so you can see this is a growing area of research um, with much more interest in actually establishing the evidence base, which is what we're here to talk about today. So we have three fabulous speakers, um, Dr. Kristen Walter from the Naval Medical Center at San Diego, um, Colonel uh, Sally Coulthard of the Defense Garden Scheme from the United Kingdom, and Catherine Game, um, who's the Executive Director of the Brushwood Center at Ryerson Woods in Lake County, Illinois. So I'd like to first introduce Dr. Um, Kristen Walter. She is a uh, clinical psychologist who does research on um, clinical psychology and surf and hike therapy at the Naval Health Research Center in San Diego. And with that, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Kristen. Okay. Um, good day, everybody. I thank you all for being here today. It's really an honor to be with you presenting on the psychological effects of outdoor recreation activities among service members and veterans. And before I say anything further, I am a federal employee, so the content of the presentation is my own and not reflective of the policy or position of the Department of Defense, Department of Veterans Affairs, or the US government. And I will be presenting two studies today, one um, at the VA and one at the Department of Defense, um, and both have approved IRB protocols. So with that, I move on to a question I often get as a psychotherapy researcher was my initial start. I often get asked the question of, okay, why should there be benefits, you know, psychological benefits of outdoor activities? And so just to throw it out there to begin, one of the things is that it has more advantages than disadvantages. And sometimes we can't say that for our options for treatment, such as medications. But even more than that, outdoor recreation combines a whole host of factors that we know have mental health benefits. Those include physical activity or exercise, being in the natural environment and being outdoors, having social contact with others, and then opportunities for not only mindfulness, but respite from psychological symptoms. So today I'm happy to present on outdoor activities, like I said, for both veterans and the active duty service member populations. So I will start with the National Veteran Summer Sports Clinic because this is where this entire line of research actually started for me. When I moved to San Diego in 2013, one of the first things I had the opportunities to do was serve as a water volunteer at the surf venue at the National Veteran Summer Sports Clinic. And it was through observing what was happening and realizing that what I was seeing in the water is actually what I try to do in a psychotherapy setting it just was happening through a different medium. And so it was this 
experience that inspired all of this subsequent work. So although I've been a volunteer at that venue since 2013, my team and I volunteered to do a study um, replicating some of the work we did in the Department of Defense. And we partnered with the National Veteran Summer Sports Program to look at their outcomes. And so I'll first present those findings for you today. So for those of you who might not be familiar with the National Veteran Summer Sports Clinic, it is a one week program in San Diego where veterans from around the country who have either a physical or psychological condition come to San Diego and they participate in five different activities over the course of the week. Those include surfing, cycling, sailing, kayaking, and then rowing or pickleball, depending on the year, and archery in the afternoon. For our study, participants completed assessments before and after the week-long program, as well as three months later. And because it's a single group design, which is not awesome science, we added a pre to post assessment after each activity to better understand the unique effects of each activity. It was a two year study and we had 74 veteran participants, 35 in year 2017 and 39 in year 2018. So these findings were just published last month and to highlight what we found, over the course of the week, we found that depression, anxiety, social functioning, as well as positive and negative emotions significantly improved over the course of the week. We did not find changes in either insomnia or resiliency, so I will mention that. Um, however, what we found is that scores actually returned to baseline three months later, which I'll come back to. Now, we also looked at those daily assessments before and after each session, and we found over the course of the day, there were significant decreases in depression and anxiety symptoms, as well as positive affect. And interestingly, the degree of change did not differ across days. So whether it was day one or day four or five, the degree of change was comparable. Similarly, we also looked at comparisons between the different activities, you know, are water-based different than land-based? And we didn't find any differences between the activities, nor did we find differences in the order in which they completed. So essentially, it didn't matter the day, the order, or the activity, the degree of change in depression and anxiety and positive affect was comparable across days. So what are our takeaways from this study? That we found that the program has beneficial effects on mental health symptoms and functioning over the course of the week-long program. And interestingly, there are not differential effects based on order or type of activity. I think this is really important because we have veterans from all over the country that come out to participate in this program. They may fall in love with something like surfing or sailing, but if they go home and they don't have access to a body of water or to the sport, at least they know, okay, well, any other activity such as cycling, I can participate in. And so I think that those psychological benefits are great that we didn't necessarily find them between the activities. And so it's whatever people can engage in potentially. But importantly, symptoms rebounded three months after the program, and this highlights the need for ongoing engagement. A lot of times with activity-based programming and adaptive sports programs, they are time limited in nature. They're three or four days or a week long. And so it's great to expose veterans to these programs, but we need to be thinking about the next step about how we get them engaged in these programs or these activities on a daily basis when they return home in order to maintain those benefits. So I mentioned that my experience with the National Veteran Summer Sports Clinic prompted my research um, in the Department of Defense. 
And so when I moved over to the Department of Defense and grant writing became part of my job, I wrote a grant to study the psychological effects of surf therapy. And we partnered with the Naval Medical Center San Diego Surf Therapy Program, which was in existence long before the funding for the study. And it is actually provided as an option of standard care for at the hospital for service members. And so a surf therapy appointment is a medical appointment and they get a note. Um, and so our first phase of the study was a program evaluation of this program. Again, single group design, um, not the strongest science. So we really tried to build upon the science in phase two, where we conducted a randomized control trial of surf therapy to hike therapy for active duty service members with major depressive disorder. Phase one is completed and those results have been published. Phase two, we are done with recruitment and we just started data analysis, but I don't have any of those findings for you today. So with phase one, this study also had 74 participants. However, they were active duty service members and they had either a physical or a psychological diagnosis, diagnosis. The two diagnoses that were most common, we had just over half with probable post-traumatic stress disorder and 43% with probable major depressive disorder. Unlike the National Veteran Summer Sports Clinic that's one week in duration, the Naval Medical Center San Diego Surf Therapy Program is six weeks in duration. So participants receive one three to four hour session each Thursday. And they also have the option for an optional hour of beach yoga prior to. Participants completed assessments before and after the program and before and after each session. This was the first study and we did not do a great job with the follow-up, which is why you will see it in the subsequent studies, but we didn't have three month follow-up data for this study. So what did we find here? That over the course of the six week program, symptoms of depression, PTSD, among those with probable PTSD and anxiety significantly decreased. Also negative emotions significantly reduced while positive emotions significantly increased. We did not find any changes in pain uh, nor insomnia, which I'll come back to on the next slide. So I mentioned that we assess participants before in each um, surf therapy session. I'll be honest, I wasn't sure when we were doing this research if we would find any changes in three to four hours because I couldn't find any psychological literature that administered these assessments that, that, with that frequency. However, we found significant and large effect sizes for our reductions in depression and anxiety even over the course of three to four hours and improvements in positive affect. We did not find changes again in pain and weekly insomnia. And to just talk about that briefly, it seemed the mean for pre to post session pain was almost identical. And it seems that some people's pain improved, some may have actually worsened and some stayed the same. So there were just no changes overall for the group. Also, we assessed weekly insomnia, um, and it's unlikely that that was sensitive enough to pick up a day of surfing, um, the effects of that. And so we use activity tractors for our subsequent study to try and get a sense enough measure, but it wasn't for this study. And I just wanna point out that I think this picture summarizes the results quite well, because if you look at this participant's foot, you will see that he was just stung by a stingray, but if you look at his face, you cannot tell that. So that is highlighting that even if pain does not change or it actually increases, there can be still positive affect improvements. So what were our takeaways from this study? We learned that there were immediate benefits of surf therapy on mental health. And I didn't show this graph, um, but what we found is that participants either for, for depending on the measure, if it's positive or negative, they improved over the course of the session, but symptoms kind of rebounded the next week and then there was a subsequent decrease. And so the immediate effects were not sustained between sessions. We don't know how long they last, but we do know that they don't last a full week. 
And so surf, a surf session needs to occur for the mood improvements. And it almost seems as though it's like a medication where you take your daily dose of surf therapy, you reap the benefits, and then you get your dose the next day. Um, and importantly, surf therapy can complement traditional treatment approaches. 75% of our participants were receiving other types of care, including more traditional psychotherapy or pharmacotherapy. So although it may be a standalone treatment, we don't have those data right now. And so the recommendation is that surf therapy can complement more traditional treatment approaches. So these are the references. As I mentioned, the findings from both of these studies have been published. Those are available if anyone would like um, more detail about them. And programs and the research do not ha uh, happen without an amazing community of people. So I would just like to um, acknowledge everyone who took part in the programs or research in these studies. And I thank you for your time and attention this morning and would be happy to answer questions later Later in the program. Dr. Horton, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> what I was saying is we are going to hold questions unless it is a very specific clarifying question at this point so that we can have a broader discussion um, at the end. So with that, I will um, introduce our next speaker, who is um, Dr. Sally Coulthard. Ah, there we go. Um, and also, um, Sally has brought her colleague, Dr. Andrea Elner with her. And unfortunately, I don't have um, Andrea on um, the slide, but I will let her give a brief introduction to herself. Um, Colonel Coulthard is retired from the British Army. She has a master's degree in social and therapeutic horticulture. And based on her work for her master's degree, she is the founder and manager of the um, and managing director of the Defense Garden Scheme in the UK. With that, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Sally and Andrea. Am I there now and unmuted? Apologies for that, because I think I was muted before. Yeah, you're unmuted, and now you just need to hit the slideshow and start from the beginning. And can you see now? I think it's there. Um, we're seeing it in the- paused. Oh, hang on, why? Uh, resume share, sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm seeing your screen. It's not the sharing. What you want to do is hit the- um, button in the far left corner that says um, start from show from the start. In the upper left hand corner of the PowerPoint menu, just underneath the home button. Yeah, which isn't there because I'm back on this whole. Oh, goodness. Okay, exit. What you want to do is exit view. Okay, click on the view button from that's working, that works. Okay, you were in the slideshow. There we go. Yeah, thank okay. you, and I do apologize. <laughs> and so, right, moving swiftly on. Um, thank you both uh, Terry and Kevin very much for uh, inviting me today. Um, as uh, the previous speakers have said, it's an honor to be taking part in this uh, conference. And uh, I know that uh, our team of whom there are two or three members here uh, we're all we are already learning a, a lot from it and for me personally um, it's very good to be back uh, even if it's only virtually in the United States and particularly in the Chicago area um, because uh, as Terry introduced 
Um, the work that I'm about to present to you has come from an evidence base from uh, the Masters in Social and Therapeutic Horticulture um, that I did a couple of years ago, but predominantly, and a lot of the content of this presentation, uh, predominantly from a Winston Churchill Fellowship that I was awarded in 2019, which involved the opportunity to go and visit uh, practice veterans-based nature-based therapy in both Scandinavia, where I focused at the University of Copenhagen and the work with the Danish Army that they do there, uh, but then a six-week travel fellowship to the, to the United States, going coast to coast, um, and that's where I met Terry um, and have, was particularly taken by not only the research approach um, that's taken, but also the partnership work at the Chicago Botanic Garden, um, and you'll see that uh, as we go through. Um, I've chosen today to take a high level view, uh, overview, uh, to orientate you to the Defence Garden Scheme. And I have to preface it by saying I have to a certain extent taken for granted that this audience accepts the benefits of nature-based therapy. Um, and so I'm going to concentrate on the context, uh, the historical context, a uh, recent context, uh, and the requirement for this sort of therapy for UK veterans and service leavers, uh, but also our operating model, the network, and some details of the programme. And the reason uh, that I've asked Dr. Andre Elner to join me uh, towards the end of the presentation is I am very conscious that this is a research week um, and Andrea heads up our developing research focus. And we'd very much like to share that with you and hopefully collaborate um, moving forward if an opportunity arises. So the Defence Garden Scheme is a developing um, nationwide network of in barracks and community gardens. Um, it's a regionally based model and ma majority of our work for the last two or three years until some funding that came through in the early part of this year has been in a specific region, um, that in, uh, in Northern Ireland, um, and with a particular cohort of veterans, obviously, uh, in that region. Um, but we have now started, uh, as of this year, to move into new gardens in the northwest of England and the southwest of England on this model, which I'll explain, the hub and spoke model. Um, and actually that model uh, feeds into one of the comments uh, Christian made in her presentation. We're very keen on the progression post the, the 10 week intervention that we deliver uh, and making sure that there are opportunities at the end of the 10 week programme locally. So what we do is we provide, we deliver and we evaluate a nature based therapy intervention for UK service leavers and veterans. And then as we're developing and as where we're working in partnership, the gardens mature, uh, there are individual workshops and programmes for service families. Um, they don't attend the actual 10 week intervention, but we are very keen to make sure that there's nature based therapy opportunities uh, for families as well. So, as I said, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the, the context, uh, the model, the network, and then uh, hand over to Andrea. What um, we have uh, found, what, as I started to do the masters and started to look into this, um, we have a House of Commons Defence Select Committee and in the autumn of 2019, they were uh, having two inquiries into the scale of mental health uh, requirements amongst military armed forces personnel and also uh, the scale of the provision. And so there was at that, uh, there were two specific findings uh, there are a number of very relevant findings, but two specific findings um, that there was a stark gap. This is November 2019, a stark gap in the provision of, me of mental health care. And that despite improvements, um, because it's not as though any, you know, there weren't charities and the, there were facilities, but despite improvements, there was no doubt uh, that a number of people, a significant number of people were still being uh, failed by the system. Um, and picking up on uh, Terry's point, and I've been aware um, with uh, some of the conferences I've been in with uh, Aaron, who's in the audience, of your move into nature-based therapy, uh, sort of coming into law. Um, we very recently uh, had a, a movement in a similar direction, not uh, for nature-based therapy, but for support for veterans in general. We've had an armed forces covenant uh, for about five or six years, which has encouraged um, private industry, um, big employers, local authorities, uh, to support, to sort of proactively support the Armed Forces Covenant. Um, it has made some progress, but only three weeks ago in our annual Queen's speech, um, that support is now going to be um, moved into legislation through the introduction of an Armed Forces Bill. And so we think, um, you know, that's clearly going to create a, a more supportive environment. 
we have a supportive environment that when we talk to local authorities, etc. But it just, I think, will give it some traction uh, into moving it into into action. As far as the actual scheme um, that I'm talking about, as I say, uh, the the concept, the evidence. Um, uh, I've written a. Um, a full fellowship report uh, which is available online and has got all of the references and the underpinning evidence as to how we've developed the scheme. Uh, that was a sort of research phase prior to actually piloting, so that was uh, over the period uh, of a, about a year, 18 months in 2018 and 2019. And then in January 2019, I was asked by the particular garden that I'll show you on the border in uh, between Northern and Southern Ireland uh, to pilot the first phase. Uh, and since then, through from sort of January 19 through to having to close slightly early with the start of the pandemic in March 20, we've run five interventions um, at this garden. I'll, I'll demonstrate in another garden in the north and northern Ireland, taken approximately 40, so five interventions across two gardens and approximately 45 um, in that over this period, veterans only, not yet service leavers. And the phase we're now in, which I've referred to is moving from that single region into two other regions in the United Kingdom, one in the Northwest and one in the Southwest, but we will be developing in the same way as the regional model, which I'll explain. And I just wanted to anchor us here because I think um, Fernando, the US Marine that said, it's therapy without labels and we don't do labels. Um, I did find myself thinking, why do I have to write 15,000 words about why nature-based therapy is a good idea for military people? Because he summed it up in a single <laughs> sentence. Um, and this is uh, the veterans uh, program uh, that I went to see um, and it partners with Thresholds and Fernando heads up the military veterans department and goes around Chicago collecting them and once a week uh, they go uh, up to this program. And it was that particular partnership and it was Barbara Kresge, who is a mutual colleague of uh, Terry uh, and myself. And it was her publication in the, uh, the Journal of Living Museums that said, you know, the strongest nature-based therapy partnerships, uh, community interventions are those that work in partnership where the nature-based therapy stay in their swim lane and deliver and evaluate. Um, and the mental health care provider who believes in the green therapy continues to manage the case management uh, of the individuals, um, doesn't want to deliver the therapy themselves, doesn't have the resources or the garden or the expertise. Um, and it's bringing those two things together and obviously bringing them together with a funder and with a university. Uh, and that was a very strong finding of my fellowship report. And it's absolutely the basis on which uh, the Defence Garden Scheme model is uh, created. Coming back to the hub and spoke, which is very important, when I talk about a hub, we don't own these gardens. We partner with the garden provider. Uh, the one I'll explain to you is um, uh, Lord Brookborough. He owns a large estate in, uh, in Northern Ireland and it has a walled garden. That walled garden is delivering productive market produce for um, the local population and restaurants in Belfast, um, but he wants to use it for the wider community. So his head gardener who has a um, an interest and has done a, a diploma in counselling. Um, he's the sort of anchor horticulturalist. We bring in the trained therapist. So we have our, our model is a team of two um, and then eight clients. Uh, it is a 10 week programme and they come for one three hour session a week. So not dissimilar to the surf programme we heard about in the six weeks. Um, but we're very clear that we want to be able to support people and we don't want them to feel better at the end of the 10 weeks and then go home and back to the worries and maybe the debts and the and the problems that have caused the, the isolation and the anxiety so we also have spoke gardens that are linked to the hub this is very much developing and i wouldn't pretend to you that it's all there but we have the spoke gardens developing these are very much existing community local very small allotments um, but it does mean that we can offer to the, one of the eight people, any of the eight people who don't have their own garden, who want to continue on a community basis, they can continue locally. And I saw that model when I started to look at it um, as a flow from the hub to the spoke. What's been really powerful in our findings is um, increasing access to people who are vulnerable, who won't put up their hand and say, I want to go to the big house. I want to go to the 10 week program. They will go down to the allotments, but actually when they feel safe there, they trust who they're working with, they can be taken up. Would you like to come up and meet Dougal? Would you like to come and meet Siobhan? And that flow is actually increasing access to a more vulnerable group and flowing back to the hub. 
Our operating model I've spoken about, I won't labour the point, but the partnership is critical. And at a tactical level, the hub programme, which we have manualised, which isn't available online, but I can share, um, you know, if, if, if uh, it would be of interest, uh, is a 10 week programme. We have manualised that programme um, and we have a series of uh, therapeutic outcomes for each session. They're either physical, cognitive, emotional or social. So bringing that regional model to life in Northern Ireland, we have three hub gardens, one in the barracks in Lisbon uh, in 38 Brigade, one up in the north in Colrain, and one on the border at Colbrook Park, which I've mentioned. And we're finding, and it was similar experience, I think I picked up anecdotally on my research trips, there's about a one and a half hour radius. Uh, and this applied again in the cage in Copenhagen and 100% attendance over the 10 weeks and by 100 pretend attendance, I don't mean eight veterans attend every week for 10 weeks, which is three months and obviously other things happen, but 100% psychological attendance in that they've either said the week before I can't come and even with the two uh, more extreme complex cases where they did disappear off the radar, they did reappear within two or three days, either to the therapist on WhatsApp or to a fellow colleague uh, or to their case manager. So compared with our experience of, of, of an intervention in a hospital where they'll go and then disappear and you write them a letter and they disappear completely, um, we are connected to them for that whole 10 week period uh, and can uh, give them a lot of support. So this is the garden at Colebrook. Um, again, coming back to the partners, we partner with the regional office, the veteran support office for Northern Ireland the actual obviously landowner and the estate and the employer of the head garden and then our mental health partner the thresholds equivalent is the Brookhouse health and well-being center so they have the well-being advisors uh, they have the clients they have the veterans and they believe that as part of their um, care they they should attend this program um, other referrals come in through to Brookhouse from our national uh, veteran charities combat stress, plasma, aftercare are just some examples in this region. Um, again, important to emphasize that we don't own the case management, but we have uh, a safeguarding referral process by which if we need to, we, we connect every week back into the referral partner. That was our funding, uh, or is our funding for this particular project. And just to summarize, it's one three hour session a week, eight participants with a two, a two man delivery team. But we do also, bring in in week six a veteran because it's quite likely in, in all of our projects that neither of those two staff members are a veteran and in week six we bring in a veteran probably on a volunteer basis and he talks to each of the individuals about their ideas and their thoughts for progression along with their well-being manager uh, caseworker so that we can talk to them about volunteering opportunities and for those that might be interested in either studying or training or going to the spoke gardens. Just a couple of slides to show that um, we're not always in a smart walled garden, although obviously that does create a safe and secure and it is an ideal outdoor classroom, but there's the garden in the barracks and the other community-based garden up at Ashes to Gold. Um, my research is all uh, available through the Defence Gardens website research page, but also through the Winston Churchill uh, uh, Memorial Trust website. And as I say, uh, there's the manual, which we have in hard copy and, and I have an electronic version. This really, I think, is a summary, which I'll let you read. I think I've mentioned all of those points. And really just to summarize with one particular example and a case study, I've got this photograph here of beekeeping. We found out of 45, this was quite a surprise, out of the 45 clients we took through in that initial period before COVID slightly disrupted us last year, um, about eight or nine were interested in beekeeping. Um, and actually beekeeping, you know, is a really, I didn't know this, um, but I've subsequently been on a beekeeping day myself. You know, you have to manage your own symptoms, otherwise the bees will swarm, you have to focus. Um, and it actually is a very useful way of, of, of being able to share 
uh, how you can manage your own mental health system, uh, symptoms. Um, and it is particularly appealing to military veterans and it gives them an opportunity. Uh, we now are trying to add in um, beekeeping training as, an, in, as a, an integral part of progression in Northern Ireland. We've had one session in January this year um, and it was very well attended. Um, and uh, it means they can you know, move into the community, into a beekeeping society, to talk about beekeeping but probably find their military skills and training means they can feature in that group and again that all builds their connections and self-esteem not based on their military identity but based on uh, a different interest. Um, we had a particularly um, I say rewarding but you know powerful example of a very well, young soldier um, he'd got four or five children uh, from two or three different partners uh, he had quite extreme depression, very isolated. Um, and as a result of the course, uh, he came on the programme, he came on in the summer of 2019. Um, he made friends uh, with uh, another client on the course who's in his 50s and they meet uh, to go fishing. He now volunteers up at uh, the barracks garden. I, to be honest, I'm not sure he ever went through with doing the training, but he, he's, he had some interest in doing the training at the local college and, um, you know, COVID has sort of, got in the way but um, we're still in touch with him. We make sure they have a range of volunteering opportunities and these are all just examples of how we're developing um, ongoing progression. This is where we are just before I hand over um, for the final bullet for Andrea to talk about research. Uh, it's a different conversation but it, it is important to share that we're finding it difficult to get people to come out of isolation. You know, having working with a group of people that are anxious and uh, depressed and were socially isolated before COVID, having been told to stay in their houses for a year. Uh, we've had two programs starting, one in April and one today. Um, and in both cases, we've had eight places. And at the moment, we've only got four or five people attending. Um, but I've just heard back from the Manchester program that started this morning. Um, actually, five turned up and they're saying that two more are coming next week. So, But it is just interesting compared with the early days when it wasn't a problem filling the courses. Um, we're now looking at our funding for this expanding network. Um, and... Uh, I'd like to hand over to Andrea just to talk about where we are, not on the research that I've done to get us to this point, but how we now want to use the network uh, to develop our research. Thank you very much, Sally, for um, this rather comprehensive introduction to, to our endeavours. And hopefully we, we, we will have a lively discussion if I don't take too much time um, talking about where we currently are and what we are thinking of doing in the medium term future. Um, a quick introduction of myself. I am uh, teaching at the Defence Studies Department, King's College London. We're based in Rivenham, which is um, the Joint Staff College, um, which is south of Oxford. It's probably the easiest way of, of, of locating it. I've been there for quite a long time. I started out being particularly interested in military technology. My, my PhD was on this, but as soon as I started working with the military, people became so much more interesting. And that's brought me into the wider realm of um, civil military relations, military and society from a historical and um, political science perspective. That's where my two disciplinary um, sort of facts sit. Um, and so I, I, I do broadly conceived civil military relations research, but with a focus on gender armed forces and war and peace, which is one leg and the other leg is looking into moral injury as a distinct other aspect of, of related to mental health, but it's not, for me, it's much more than, 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 than I don't wanna say just a mental health issue. It goes much further than this. Um, I met Sally, through a roundabout way and I am extremely pleased when or was extremely pleased when she offered me to take on the lead of the research and development um, group within the defense um, garden scheme on a volunteer basis sometimes that's conflicting with with some of the sort of day job um, uh, requirements but I love doing this because I strongly believe in in, in the entire endeavor um, where are we currently? We're, in a sense for us, the, the, the COVID sort of enforced quietness on the therapeutic front has in some ways actually helped us a little bit to take stock because Sally's work has paid off 
in spades. It, <laughs> not, no pun intended. It is, she's been so successful at setting up the Defence Garden Scheme um, that we've grown quite a lot. And we are currently in a position where we're asking ourselves, is measuring the effect of the 10 week course through mainly the anxiety and depression scales of um, GAT7 and PHQ9, is that the best way of doing this? Or in order to provide the key of our mission, client-based um, therapy and, and improve, continuously improve the client experience, do we need to go wider? So currently we're discussing whether we should go down the route of, the, of collecting data um, through uh, the application of a form of the um, well-being inventory, which um, Matt Fossey at Anglia Ruskin University, who I know is in the audience, um, has adapted to a British environment. So we're looking into this. The worry there, and I'm more than happy, or we're more than happy to discuss this with the audience if we get an opportunity, the worry with this is that it is quite involved and over a 10 year, a 10 year, 10 week course, it might be asking clients too many questions because it's not about, we need data, but we don't want to make it about data. If you, I, I'm sure you, you know exactly what I, what I mean. For us as a, as a nonprofit, well, as a, as a not really profit organization, as a self-sustained, ultimately, hopefully organization, the reason for data collection is not only to improve client experience directly, that means gathering clients' views, but also therapists' experiences um, and the profile of the intervention progress or the progression. But we also need to use the data to satisfy funders' requirements, which can be very different, and researchers in a wider context, which is where I sit as a non-clinical person. Um, and the strategic planning. So this is quite a, a, a delicate balance that we need to somehow strike. This is the data side of things. This is the more quantitative side of things. What we also want to do is gather lived experiences of people who have come to one of the gardens and gone through the 10 week program and are willing to share with us where they've come from, how they've experienced the therapy and what's happened next. And ideally, um, as Kirsten did for, or is doing for their surf therapy, try to keep tabs on longer term outcomes and where do people go? So this is what we're currently trying to navigate. Um, in the medium term, we're hoping to explore barriers to, um, to access to therapy of this kind, um, with a particular emphasis on um, black and minority ethnic groups, um, that's a category in the, in the British context, and, and, and women, um, female veterans. And related to this, the question of why do some people not come and seek assistance? Um, we know that reservists have, have sometimes a very high threshold to wanting to seek help because they don't necessarily want to be seen as in need of seeking help. There are all sorts of other issues involved with this. So that is one strand. The other strand that I would like to develop is, is more of a dedicated approach to allowing people to move, to use the 10 week program. If they get to a point where they know where they would like to go to then find pathways into education, whether that is vocational education and training or further education or higher education that allows them then to do in the civilian world something that gives them the same sense of value and self-worth and enjoyment and self-direction and, and, and satisfaction and, and maybe even happiness in life as they might have experienced at some point in their military career, that would be an ideal way of, of an ideal approach and, 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 and way of sort of making use of the therapy in a, in a, in a longer term context. So this is in a, in, in a very sort of tiny nutshell where we are and where we would like to go. I'd be delighted to discuss either in the Q&A session if we have time or if anyone would like to ping me directly 
I'm at King's College London and I'm happy to, to publish my, my email address. You can also get us through the Defence Garden Scheme um, website where we hopefully then um, start a very fruitful discussion. So thank you very much for giving us time and space and your attention. And I shall hand over to Terry. Okay, so actually we're just gonna go straight to Catherine because we're running a little bit behind. So Catherine Gain, take it away and please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thanks, Terry and Kevin. <laughs> um, this is a really fascinating conversation and I'm so excited to be a part of it. Uh, I'm Catherine Game. I'm the executive director of Brushwood Center at Ryerson Woods. Uh, we are located just north of Chicago um, and we're uh, joining this panel to provide some context around community partnership. Um, we, we are a nonprofit organization and we work in partnership with many veteran organizations across the, our area, um, but especially the Captain James A. Level Federal Healthcare Center, uh, which is just about 20 minutes from our location. Um, so first, a little background on Brushwood. Our mission is to promote the importance of nature for cultivating creativity, nurturing well-being, and inspiring learning. And we uh, facilitate cultural arts and educational programs to really deepen people's relationship with the natural world. Um, and here's just a quick shot of images across our programs. You can see we work with a wide range of audiences um, across generations and geographies really in uh, the Chicago area. And our work is really targeting two interrelated intersectional problems one being the unhealthy state of nature in our region and of the environment where increasing threats like invasive species, climate change and pollution uh, decrease the quality of our ecosystems. This photo is actually of a coal plant that's located uh, just, you know, just a couple miles away actually from the Naval Base and the, um, the Captain James A. Level Federal Healthcare Center. And, and then the second problem is people's health, especially right now coming out of COVID-19, um, but also thinking about the increasing rate of chronic diseases and behavioral health issues that we know disproportionately impact many of our region's communities, and that includes military veterans. So our programs are really based on this belief that we can only heal the planet by also participating in the healing of our communities. And we uh, use a lot of the research, some of which has been highlighted in this presentation, which is wonderful, um, to inform our theory of change, recognizing the critical role of nature in mental and physical health alongside the arts as tools to inspire care for our human and ecological communities, um, as well as you know, the arts providing many mental health benefits too through creative expression. And in this regard, you know, there's no question that our communities need to aim support for veterans' mental health, uh, especially in the midst of COVID-19. Uh, veteran suicide rates are 50% higher than that of non-veteran residents, with women particularly at risk, um, with more than 40% reporting military sexual harassment or trauma, and that's just reporting. We anticipate those numbers are actually higher than that. Um, and, you know, veterans also face disproportionately higher rates of substance abuse, depression, and other challenges reintegrating into society and that, as everyone has kind of alluded to, has really been exacerbated during the pandemic. Uh, so our work at Brushwood Center whoops, uh, began with veterans about six years ago when we launched a nature photography program with an organization that provides mental health services to veterans. The program is called At Ease, and it empowers military veterans' well-being using the two therapeutic modalities of exposure to nature and the arts to provide coping mechanisms for stress, anxiety, PTSD, social isolation, and other adverse mental health outcomes. So we provide free art and nature programs in partnership with the Captain James A. Level Federal Healthcare Center and Lake County uh, veterans organizations, as well as other organizations across the Chicago area, uh, growing over the last year to support more than 250 veterans um, across the region. And with last year being uh, many virtual and 
self-guided opportunities as we adapted to the pandemic restrictions. So our model has always included three parts. Um, one is an art lesson by a professional artist, preferably a veteran whenever possible. So they bring their experiences and story to, um, to the uh, excursion. The second is an outdoor nature component. Um, and third is this kind of coming together, uh, group affirmation to provide social connection centered around the experience. Uh, during COVID, as I kind of alluded to, we've had to make a lot of adaptations to this structure, which we'll get to momentarily. Uh, but first, I'd like to share this video from one of our pre-pandemic programs uh, to give you a sense of the structure of at ease. Make sure my sound is shared. Great. Get it nice and big. Glenda Battle served our country for 16 years in the Navy. She now suffers from PTSD. So with PTSD, it can involve chronic pain, depression, anxiety, stress. So sometimes it's just knowing what um, what's called triggers, knowing what they are, and then once you can identify them, then you can basically use coping skills or certain tools that you've learned to minimize those. Uh, symptoms. Battles triggers are watching negative news stories and being in large public spaces. She hasn't watched TV since Monday. Programs like At Ease offered at the Brushwood Center in Riverwoods help veterans like her get mental illness treatment through connecting with nature. About 20 veterans a day who commit suicide. So programs like these that provide community support to military veterans are really crucial. Stopping to smell the roses, or in this case, photograph them, has helped immensely with her depression and anxiety. Nature is a natural healing anyway, so it allows me to take in the beauty that's around me. Through the At Ease program, the Brushwood Center collaborates with the Captain James A. Level Federal Health Care Center to provide three-hour workshops for veterans to learn the basics of photography. The program builds on research showing that exposure to nature improves mental health, self-esteem and other obstacles veterans face during their transition to civilian life. What it really means is two or three hours out of the house and sunshine. <laughs> so many things I, uh, I love about that. Um, and actually, Glenda, who was featured um, initially there, she is on our advisory board uh, for of veterans for the program and now it helps to like design and inform many of the uh, workshops that we're offering. So very exciting. So that video is from 2019, um, at which point we, uh, you know, we were at this and it was really interesting, Sally, to hear your discussion of the hub and spoke model. Um, we were at this point where the program was getting a lot of traction and it was clear we needed to identify a strategy for growth. Um, and so we identified, we worked with an external strategy consultant who helped us identify you know, this service model that has uh, four major roles. Oops, here we go. Um, you know, Brushwood Center providing the art, the learning, the overall shape of the program, a public land agency partner. So Brushwood Center, we are based in a forest preserve, but the preserve is actually managed by a public land agency like County Forest Preserves. And the Chicago area is really blessed with many incredible land agencies who um, you know, help to care for and steward open spaces and who are, in, in our experience, very eager to host programs like this as well, which is exciting. Um, in addition, veteran service organizations obviously provide connection to veterans, recruitment help, in some cases, um, mental health, services as well, and then funders to help uh, support the program, the artist costs, everything kind of goes along with coordinating that. Um, so we've, you know, really found that this model maximizes the strengths of each contributing partner. And I know, you know, the VA system as a whole is really thinking about this, about how to promote community partnerships and really maximize leveraging resources in this way knowing that there are so many organizations and individuals who want to help 
Um, and you know, this type of opportunity for collaboration really allows everybody to bring their strengths to the table um, with, uh, the, with adapting to participant needs and also the flexibility that might be required for different populations. Uh, so just as here's an example, and I know we're running a little short on time, but I wanted to give a couple examples of the programs that we've done over the last year adapting to COVID-19. Um, you know, we have this ongoing partnership with the Level Federal Healthcare Center in North Chicago, um, which is the only combined VA and Department of Defense hospital system in the country. They actually just celebrated their 10 year anniversary as a dual facility last year. Um, and we partnered with their recreational therapy department to provide ongoing programs, uh, which over the last year have included virtual painting classes for residents as, and outpatients, as well as a new series in coordination with their military sexual trauma coordinator, specifically designed for women uh, veterans. And so all of these programs culminate in exhibition opportunities for veterans to share their work, uh, including a partnership with the Veterans Annual Creative Arts Festival. So it's a really exciting kind of, um, as what was alluded to, not just a one-off program, but an opportunity to kind of build on these experiences over time and create a sense of pride to, uh, with participants. Additionally, we partner with community veteran organizations um, to support families of veterans. So groups like Kids Rank, uh, there's a wonderful organization, Growing Healthy Veterans, that supports uh, community gardens locally. As, as well as many other partners. This photo is actually from an event called Kayak for Conservation that we held in partnership with the Shed Aquarium on the Chicago River. <laughs> so many opportunities for outdoor recreation, even if we don't have the surfing uh, capabilities, perhaps. Um, and, you know, additionally, we've kind of gotten creative with some of the combined virtual and on-site programs. This is a partnership with the U.S. Forest Service, Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie, um, which is the kind of southwest end of the Chicago region, hosting a series, a photography series with virtual classes, but then in-person self-guided opportunities. Um, and that was a really powerful experience for many of the folks. We created a calendar um, that was printed and a virtual exhibition with that as well. So, um, you know, the other opportunity we've seen is through the photography is just expanding to other public land agencies. Uh, and so this year we're doing currently a birding, birding and photography challenge. So if you know anyone in the Chicago area, any veterans who you think might be interested in participating, please share. And this is running all the way through November. We've been doing virtual um, educational programs and then we have on-site tours uh, and workshops available as well. Uh, and this year we also just launched a music and nature program with a conductor who joined our team in the fall providing virtual concerts um, and starting a piano and nature education program. We're actually coordinating with Dr. Horton um, and Kevin and researchers from Rosalind Franklin University right now to initiate a research study on the impact of music and nature on chronic pain with a psychologist from Levels Pain University. Uh, and so that will be interesting to see, like looking at both interventions uh, individually and then together uh, as well as a control group to see what the impacts, um, you know, potentially are. So I did, I mentioned too, we uh, recently launched a veteran advisory group to integrate veteran input into the design and evaluation of the program. There's really no better way to do this um, than just directly, you know, involve participants in helping to design the programs. So uh, we're excited to move that forward. Currently for our evaluation process, we use post surveys, um, which we developed the questions with this group out of Harvard University. Um, but you know, to Andrea's point, the initial survey was so long, it's like the survey itself became an intervention. So we had to really narrow down the number of questions uh, we were asking and really focus, uh, focus them. But what we have been able to find uh, 269 veterans served in total over the last year. 93% um, of respondents surveyed agreed that either being in nature or creating art, and these were two different questions, um, helped them to release tension. 
93% agreed that being in nature or creating art helps them to learn more about themselves. Um, then 75% stated that the program increased self-confidence. We also heard uh, qualitatively from many participants during the last year uh, that the program was an opportunity to combat social isolation. Uh, so I think it's interesting that, you know, what we find is some people respond to nature, some people respond to art, some people respond to both. When by combining some of these modalities, you kind of get the best of all possible worlds. Um, so with that, I will conclude and turn it back to Terry. Thank you so much. I think it's so exciting to see these uh, these programs and these therapies really growing as non-pharmacological methods, you know, to really increasing well-being within our military veteran community. Okay, so Catherine, so everybody, thank you for all those wonderful presentations. I think we've got a lot of interesting things to talk about. And I know Kevin is queuing up questions, but before Kevin queues up the questions, I have one um, just kind of to throw out, since we are talking about research here, and Catherine just mentioned her um, issues of you know trying to delve into working with researchers and to come up with useful tools. And I've had some similar experiences. Um, you know, as a researcher, we want to just keep digging and digging. And but on the other side, you have the practical aspects of what is it that the programs and participants can handle. So I was just going to throw it out, and that is as a nonprofit that would like to include more research and evaluations, and this can go to any and all of you, but we'll start with Catherine. But as a nonprofit that would like to include more research and evaluation, what challenges have you faced? And what could make it easier for organizations like yours to do research and evaluation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think we're, you know, what's interesting about just seeing all of these presentations today, we're really on this precipice of, I think, building momentum for more holistic healthcare generally. Um, and so it, a growing understanding of what are the metrics and tools that can be used, you know, across the board. But then there is also the need to refine those for the communities, you know, that you're working with and, and that you're serving. Um, and I think recognizing the nuances to, you know, for example, um, the women veterans group that we work with, the outcomes that we might want to measure maybe are not just depression and anxiety. Um, as I, I think it was maybe Sally who mentioned that too, like there are these broader considerations around well being um, and empowerment and, you know, people kind of taking. Uh, ownership over their lives and feeling that strength. And so finding ways to, to measure that uh, certainly are not within our uh, bandwidth as a nonprofit organization. And I think that's where the opportunities for collaboration with academic institutions is just so ripe for potential. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to add on to that? Sally or Andrea or Kristen? Oh, Sally, you're muted. Um, I'd just like to add partly because it takes us back to a conversation you and I've had, Terry, and I've shared with Andrea and came from my visit to Walter Reed, where, as I think many of you know, on the Green Road project, you know, there's a really significant academic support from Harvard. And then I went down to Arizona to the uh, Center for Integrative Medicine. And the fact that I was really taken in as a nonprofit at the moment, we haven't got this far, but picking up on physical, whether it's cortisol, whether it's saliva, whether it's heart rate, just something non-intrusive. And Terry and I started to look at, you know, was it wristbands or sweatbands or something that they could uh, wear during so that you could get some physical measurements as well as um, and as Andrew mentioned, we're looking at moving away from the GAD7 and PHQ9, partly because I hadn't realised until recently, they have been developed by pharmaceutical companies to measure the effects of, of chemical, of, you know, of, of medicine. And they also have a slightly negative uh, focus in the questioning, you know, has your anxiety increased, as opposed to a forward leaning, how are you feeling and are you feeling better? And again, you start to get into these sensitivities. So that integrate, I would like us to be able to do more on the physical. And I know that you've done something with the walking in the urban environment, Terry and things. So, you know, that, that's just part of it, but it's resources and it's capacity. Um, 
So we're all, we're all not struggling with that, but working our way through it. Okay, I see Matt Fossey has a hand up. Um, Matt, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Thanks, Terry. It's more of a comment than anything. Uh, I think, uh, Catherine, you talked about um, not having the bandwidth to do this. Um, personally, I think that actually looking at outcomes is uh, should be integral to, to what we're doing, not only for the, for the participants within the, uh, these programmes, but actually for you as a non-profit, for developing your business case to say, well, where's my next lot of funding going to come from? Because if you can't demonstrate uh, organisationally that you're having an impact and an effect, then you're less likely to be able to go to your next funder uh, and get more money to, to do what you're trying to do. So um, personally, I think that we should all be thinking about how we uh, engage with uh, not just research, but service evaluation and, uh, and good um, outcome, outcome measurement, try to understand how we're having an impact with our, uh, with our clients. Over. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, just to clarify that a little bit, I'm certainly outcomes are critical. We, we measure those, you know, through our post surveys. I think where the bandwidth consideration comes in is, you know, really the academic depth and um, richness that can come from working with researchers who may have more nuanced understanding uh, and capabilities than an NGO would be able to do. And that's really where the strength and partnership comes in, which I think is very compelling too, to investors and funders in these programs. You know, they want to see that, you know, academic institutions are also involved in these opportunities, 100%. Yeah, I'm gonna pop in as a researcher and just comment that what we're seeing building now is this concept of a culture of evaluation. And one thing that has to be done is while the funding agencies want to see evaluation, we also had to convince funding agencies that they have to pay for evaluation. <laughs> that particularly the sorts of things Andrea was mentioning, the qualitative analysis. I've been doing lots of qualitative analysis. To do qualitative analysis right takes many, many person hours. And so it takes a lot of money to do that. So you know, the more all of us who are trying to do this kind of put into our budgets that you need X amount of money to do evaluation um, is important. So I'll stop there. Kevin, what, what do you have in your bag of questions? <laughs> Thank you. A specific one for Kristen that Matt posed about what seemed to have the greatest effect. I appreciate you addressing that. And then there's a question that will go back to the entire group. And Aaron, I think you could perhaps give insight on what methods are used for measuring. I think we're touching on that. You've got biological, you've got qualitative. So Kristen, if you can address that question for that program, what seemed to make or what combination of things seem to make such an impact? Sure, so I'll just uh, address a couple of things in my response here. So um, there was a question about measurement and we looked at measures that um, are commonly used by the VA in the DOD because, you know, there's a, uh, you know, there was discussion about, you know, the G87, the PHQ9. So the fact of the matter is those are mandated in DOD. And so if we want to understand how interventions relate to our existing interventions, we need to make those data comparable. And so all of our measures were, we used the PHQ-9, the PCL-5, the G87, which are all mandated in the DOD. Then for positive affect uh, and negative affect, we used the PANIS. Um, insomnia was the insomnia severity index and pain was just a single 11 point rating scale. Our greatest effects were found for positive affect. And I think that that's a huge thing when we think, okay, so as a provider, when we successfully treat PTSD and depression, sometimes there's residual symptoms or symptoms that still remain. One of the harder things to treat in a therapeutic context is increasing positive emotions. It tends to be a little bit easier to decrease the negative than to add the positive. Mm -hmm. 
And so our strongest finding was the increase in positive affect, making it a potentially really powerful complement to existing care. We also found very strong reductions in depression and anxiety. So we were able to show not only the symptom reduction, but the change in, in affect as well. There was a question too about endorphins. No. So there was not good data. Not, there weren't a lot of data um, on the psychological effects of surf therapy. So we really wanted to focus on that, but it is a great question. And then there was a question about what were the drivers? We did not examine that at all. Um, so everything that I talked about is based on existing literature. There are a few good qualitative studies of surf therapy that talk a lot about the supporting environment, the open environment, um, and offering respite as potential drivers of that change, but we did not specifically look at that. Okay, so Kevin, what was the second half of the question? I, if I can, I'll throw it to Andrea. Okay. I see your hand up. Do you want to jump in now, Andrea? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I have one question, and it's more really a concern I have over the way in which measurements are taken. And like Kirsten, I, I recognize what you were just talking about, um, mandated measurement scales and, and categories and, and, and approaches and models. Um, there is a certain requirement that, that we all need to fulfill and that that's just sort of a bit of a straitjacket. But what I'm wondering about is one point about social prescribing is to demedicalize um, psychological pressures and dealing with them and make it less labeled, make, uh, make it less of an illness that needs fixing or the individual that needs fixing and much more about wider context and enabling and positive outlook and, 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 and just, yeah, not medicalize things. If we, is there a balance to be struck and is, is there something to be said for the research community to say, actually, qualitative feedback and and Terry I think your your suggestion that we all need to write into our funding applications funds for this because it costs money is excellent and we really need to start doing this but is there not much to be said for qualitative research which links in with the whole model and the whole idea and the rationale for social prescribing to at least complement numbers because numbers seem to be so simple and give us a clear picture but actually qualitative feedback can be so much more telling it is less quantifiable but it actually can be a lot more expressive yeah but my point is that even in doing the qualitative research to do it well to code the data and look at it in a systematic way takes money because it takes um, many many hours so yeah i'm I am a big fan of mixed methods, both quantitative and qualitative work. Erin, I see your hand up, sir. Yes. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so on, on, the, on the research elements, some of the questions that we have, and, and we do actively conduct research at the Sierra Club through a number of different uh, research universities in the US um, is, in, in many instances, we see that the samples are not demographically representative of the larger veteran population. Mm -hmm. Primarily, uh, the majority of participants are able-bodied white males and uh, may or may not be in the same socioeconomic status as a marginalized population of veterans, but clearly doesn't represent the entire population. And, and at times, um, it'll, a, a study that is only examining, uh, for, as an example, a long distance hiking program that had six uh, veterans in the sample, one white female and five white males, uh, that made it past the peer review process and into a, a journal. So whenever, I, whenever we go to um, any, any research in this field, mm -hmm. it's always a concern as to how the samples are, are are determined. Many veterans who struggle from day to day do not have the time 
to leave their homes or their jobs to participate in any type of outdoor program. So they miss out on that opportunity. And our focus is really continuing to be on the effects of community-based programs that people can access without having to use transportation that, that are designed by people who look like them, that come from their communities. That's really complicated. Uh, that's a, it's hard to develop programs that really originate at the grassroots level that are effective. Um, another concern we have is, is how we would scale anything that's successful. There's 20 million living veterans in the United States. In New, York's, in New York State, where I primarily work, we have 770,000 veterans. The average age is 65 for male and 51 for female. And 90% of the veterans in New York are male veterans. Many of them live, over 200,000 live in New York City and will tell us that they don't have access to even parks or public lands, let alone programs in the, in the, in the city because of uh, socioeconomic, cultural barriers, barriers directly connected to racism. So it's a long list of reasons why they won't participate. Meaning these are folks that have a need that we don't study how these different programs impact. We don't even know if they would want to participate in any outdoor programs we offer. So, uh, you know, those are our concerns going in. And, and anytime I speak to a research group, um, I ask the questions of, well, how do, we, how do we measure the impact of outdoor programs with communities of veterans who have never had the opportunity to participate in them? And what would the results be if we did measure the outcomes, say, you know, in the Bronx VA, where I spend a lot of my time, there's a, a group therapy, uh, there's a group, you know, doing group therapy of Vietnam veterans, they're all black men, and nobody's ever offered them a chance to go outside to go fishing or hiking or anything like that. Yeah. Now they're in their 70s. So what are they going to do? If the average age is 65, are the programs that we're examining replicable amongst that population? Or are they really just restricted to those that are able-bodied? Yeah. And if they're only restricted to able-bodied, less Last point, Teresa, uh, Terry. Um, yeah. would, would it benefit us to, to put our resources into examining programs that are more inclusive mm -hmm. and those that are more replicable across the population? I want to just throw out, you know, so far, most of the things we've been talking about, well, no, um, seem to be talking about programs that have, you know, people have to travel someplace to go for, you know, but in part, the thing about the Brushwood program is the Lovell um, Hospital is bringing people to the Brushwood Center. Um, the nice thing about the Defense Garden Scheme is that's built on the idea of being close to home where people can get there. And then the spoke part of it reaches out to place people um, or to make matches between people and their community centers. And I just wanted to mention a project that I'm involved with. Um, we have some veterans in it, but it's not specifically a veterans pro program, but it's looking at the use of a community garden or built on the property of a drug and alcohol rehab center. So I'm wondering, and also Jesse Brown Hospital, the VA Medical Center has recently built its own um, essentially therapeutic garden and community garden. It's not even billed as a therapeutic garden. So I'm wondering to what extent are we overlooking the value of both therapeutic and community gardens within local resources that could make places more accessible and in the way our discussions have talked about it in terms of giving a soft on-ramp for people who have never had these kinds of exposures and outdoors um, to kind of say, okay, you know, here are, are some raised beds. Just go get your hands dirty and grow some plants in the, the really basic format of horticultural therapy. I'll just throw that out as a discussion point. I take that real quick. At my nonprofit in, at Jesse Brown, we got a Home Depot Foundation, $5,000 community grant. And I wound up going to the rec therapist, the art therapist. We had five different rec therapy professionals go into a Home Depot. We got a big van from the VA and it was like they were registering for a wedding. They were running around with the gun, just 
chalking up all these different things. The art therapist got a big tile cutter and huge slates of tile. What we did in the horticultural kit therapy side is we wound up buying different bushes and stuff. Some of it was donated by a local nursery and we transformed the inner courtyard and created a healing sanctuary. And the veterans getting into the dirt, extracting out these old bushes, they then had a circle focus group afterwards with the rec therapist. And they talked about how they had never really gotten into that much of exertion relative to nature. And that was something that really allowed them to pour a lot of themselves into. Create a great precedent for me across the hospital that I could be somebody to bring in something like that. And I wanna acknowledge that I have a number of my colleagues from this nonprofit system across the VA hospitals where then we do a best practice share as a matter of course. We have to navigate all these contracts and other funding sources and the nuances. We also share what's working. And that's the power of our national association, NAVRA. So the fact that we are sharing all of this is really remarkable. And the fact that we can make things happen at our campuses, that's gonna impact the most number of veterans each and every day. And that's been the result at our hospital at Jesse Brown, just in my background actually there at Jesse Brown, right downtown. Can I jump in right there for a second, Kevin? Thank you for saying that because the um, I've said this several times in multiple meetings with some people in here, but the VA is the largest employer of rec therapists and being able to scale that program up from other VA systems would be amazing to say, I mean, Kevin, your knowledge and ability to manage that is amazing. Um, and when we're looking at how do we scale this up there's, there's systems in place that we could potentially fit into. Um, and thanks for including the rec therapist because sometimes we get forgotten. Yeah. Okay. I think I, oh, if I could just up. jump in just with a couple thoughts. Um, I uh, agree with that. First of all, the recreational therapists at level have been incredible to work with amazing partners. And I think, you know, Kristen's, what Kristen's research pointed to, the idea that it didn't matter what the recreational intervention was, there was still impact, really is very encouraging because it means that there are so many possibilities for recreational interventions. It doesn't have to be, you know, camping in a wilderness area. It can be community gardens. It can be nature photography. It can be, you know, doing a concert. I think there's so many ways we can grow our understanding and also listen to our communities and listen to what are the priorities um, and preferences that veterans have that they want to pursue, you know, in their own communities and in their own lives and support them in that way. Go ahead, Danielle. I just asked the question in a chat. I just wanted to know, I'm an executive director from a VA nonprofit. I just wanted to know if we were wanted to contact the rec therapists at the VA, what service line are they in? Their own, right, Jesse? They're a yep. standalone? Yep. Yeah, they're, they're stand, standalone. They're cheap. They're oh, okay, I'll, I'll look into that. Thank you. This has been great. Okay. We're just about at 90 minutes here. So Terry, if it's okay, I'll do a quick wrap. Sure. Uh, I think the first thing is we got to keep going. And yeah. the wellness, uh, be, the uh, well-being in inventory, the WBI, Matt acknowledged in the chat that it's actually a VA initiative that's now being adapted. I'd love to have a session just on that. And Jesse, with our network and Danielle, if we can get our rec therapists, we can find a time where they might kind of all be available and we can convene. So Terry, by helping set this up with your colleagues, now making it our colleagues, I see a lot of positive momentum that our group can continue to convene and talk about submission opportunities. Because yeah. bottom line, it's getting that funding and the power of precedent is going to be real as we start leveraging each other's successes. The VA Research Week, it's one team, one mission is the theme this year. And I think this program absolutely showcases that team-based approach all on the same mission of bettering the health and wellness of our veterans and their families. P4, if you've heard P3, the P4 talks about public to public partnerships just as much as there are private partnerships. The McCormick Foundation has been integral to funding Chicago area and Illinois based nonprofits that are focusing on veterans. The families and the kids of these folks are of particular interest as we look at going forward. 
and really nurturing their growth and their health. So thank you all for being a part of this. This has been remarkable. This has really made so much of Research Week, how special it is for us and the nonprofits to be able to engage on topics like this. So and I want to go ahead, Terry. Put in one last shameless plug. I put the URL for Nature, Culture, and Human Health, the NCH2 network. Um, this is exactly the kind of connectivity and capacity building that in the network is designed to do. So, you know, please connect with us so that we can, you know, potentially have a another symposium. You know, in 2016, we did a symposium entirely around connecting veterans and therapists. And so with that, I will just put in my shameless plug. So Kevin, go ahead. Well done. I see Aaron. Yes, I will do my best to navigate what features we're able to offer at the CARES website. I'll hopefully be able to post those presentations off of the, uh, the page there, and then I'll figure out how to capture the chat and make that also available. It might be by email. So I put my email in the chat, kevin.ho at va.gov. If you could just send me an email and if we can kind of track who attended today, that way I can distribute out via email to those who attended. Make sense? Awesome. Yep. Well, have a lovely day, everybody. Get outside. And I really appreciate this so much. I look forward to all of us convening again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Terry. Thank you all. Great session. Thank, Thank you very much. You. That was fantastic.